bless you guys. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. In the presence of the Lord. What a praise and worship service. I'm like, man, they ain't going to leave nothing for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Real quickly, let's get out our Bibles and go to the book of John, chapter 1. John, chapter 1. And when you get there, say, thank you, Jesus. We're going to take a look at verse number 12. John 1, verse 12. And it reads, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I want to minister this morning quickly on the subject, this is your receiving day. This is your receiving day. Father God, I just thank you this morning for the awesome opportunity to minister your word. And Lord, I ask right now that you would give me the words of wisdom, the words of knowledge, the words of understanding. Father God, that you would give me utterance to open my mouth boldly and speak as you would have me to speak. Lord, I pray that your people will hear your voice in my voice. Father God, let the body of Christ here at the Lighthouse Freedom Center be edified, built up, strengthened, refreshed, revived in the inner man like never before. Lord, let it not just be information, but let it be impartation of your spirit. Use the word this morning to speak into people's lives, speak into their situations, speak into their circumstances. Father God, I thank you for what you're going to do in advance in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, say amen. 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 How many people know it's very important to come to church? To come into the house of God. There's something that happens in a corporate anointing that comes upon the body of Christ corporately that you need for your life individually. Don't you notice that life goes a lot better when you have, go to church on Sunday? And when you miss a Sunday, things go a little rough for you? Well, that's because you didn't receive an impartation of what you needed for that this coming week. There's something that God is doing down on the inside of you that's bypassed your mind, your will, and your emotions. There's provision that God gives you, listen, at the beginning of the week to help you cope and get through situations as you walk through the week. So listen, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves as you see the day yet approaching. Never get into the habit or get into this crazy theology that I can uh, get it at home. The devil is a liar. Amen. The Bible says where there's two or three gathered in my name, the Lord said, I am there in the midst of them. So there's something that happened. Of course, we can experience God individually, but I, you got to have a corporate anointing to deal with life when you walk out the doors. So it's important what you're doing today, coming to church and God is already making deposits in you to deal with situations and circumstances that could arise in your life. Amen. This coming week, you must realize something. The problem is never the Lord. The Lord is the most generous, greatest giver of all times. The problem is never the Lord. The problem is us receiving what God has already done. How many people know that when Jesus finished Calvary, he said those words, it is finished. It is complete. And what is Jesus doing right now? The Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of Almighty God. So listen, as far as Jesus is concerned, what, he's, what he has done is already, what you're asking him for is already been done. It's not a matter of, of him doing it. It's a matter of you receiving what has already been done for your life before the foundations of the world. Now, gentlemen, can you pull up 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4 in the, in the Passion Translation? Let's read this. It says, everything we could ever need for life and complete devotion to God has already been deposited in us by his divine power. For all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him who has called us by name 
and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. As a result, he has given to you magnificent promises that are beyond all price so that through the power of these tremendous promises, you can experience partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are in the world. Notice the Bible says it has already been given to us. He made a deposit in you when you got born again a deposit that will cover all the cost of life when life throws a bill at you. Look at your neighbor and say, I already got it. Everything I need for this life is already down on the inside of me. See, it, what it does, it takes your faith from a hoping and a wishing to a now faith is. Now I got it. Now I'm healed. Now I'm blessed. Now I'm delivered. Now I'm free. Now I got the job. Now I got the position. It takes it from a hoping to a possession. And the problem is not what God has given. He's already given it. We got to learn how to receive what God has already given. It's through the promises of God that we understand what has already been given to us. For you not to have a relationship with the word of God is for you to be ignorant of what has already been given. A lot of us spend more time with the problem. We need to spend more time with the solution, with the promise, because it's an illustration showing us the heart of God toward, towards those situations. So we got to begin to saturate ourselves with the promise of God. You know, my, 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 my mandate, I, I, I talked about it on the anniversary, but my thing is I believe that my calling is to make you move from the wildernesses of life into your promised land. That you will lay hold of the promise of God and you won't just be shouting about it, praising about it. You'll be living in it and experiencing it. I've been shouting about it, but it ain't showed up yet. Gentlemen, pull up Ephesians 1, 3 in the Passion. Let's establish this is it's already been done. And it says every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us as a love gift from our wonderfully heavenly father, the father of our Lord Jesus, all because he sees us wrapped in Christ. This is why we celebrate him with our hearts. Look again. It says again, it has already been given. It has already been lavished upon us, a love gift that has already been given. Understand this, that prayer is not to persuade the Lord. Rather, it's prayer is a receiving mechanism to create a channel for us to use our faith to receive what has already been given. A lot of us try to use our prayer life to persuade God. You don't have to persuade God. His mind is already made up. He's already done it. He can't change it. He won't reverse it. His mind is settled. He wants you blessed. He wants you healed. He wants you prosperous. You don't have to twist God's arm trying to get him to do something for you. It's a matter of receiving. That's why when you pray, you got to pray the promise. You got to pray the word. Word. You got to pray the solution. Father God, I thank you in the name of Jesus that this bill's need is met because you said in Philippians 419 that you would supply all my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's a transaction. I send the promise back up to God what he said and the Bible said that his word will not return back to him vain, void, or non-productive, but it will accomplish that. That what he sent it to do. If you send the word, the word will go back to God and God will begin to manifest his promise in your life. Stop praying the problem and begin to pray the solution. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm has already been lavished upon us. Somebody say fasting. <laughs> fasting is not something that's going to move God. Fasting is to move you out of the way. 
Let me say it again. Fasting is not to move God. Fasting is to get you out of the way so you can receive what God has for your life. Why could we not cast out the demon the disciples said to Jesus? He said this kind only goes out by prayer and fasting. You couldn't do it because you're out of shape spiritually. You're trying to lift something that you have not worked up to. You need to add some fasting to that prayer and watch the power of God begin to show up in your life. Jesus said it is finished. He said thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen unto the glory of God by us. When God makes a promise, it's because he wants to fulfill it in your life. When you ask the Lord for something he promised, the promise is always yes and amen. Yes means to express affirmation. It's an affirmative word. He can't say no to something that he's already promised. Let me say it again. He can't say no to something that he's already promised. He's not going to contradict his word. You're never going to get to heaven and say he didn't do his word. The devil is a liar. Gentlemen, can you pull up Numbers 23? 19. Listen to this. God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not a human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it out? So God is not like men. Men lie. Men change their mind. When conditions change, men change. God is not fair weathered. He's the same when the sun is shining. He's the same in the middle of a hurricane. God never changes. He says he's the Lord God and he changes not. You can take it to the bank. Sometimes we let our feelings and our emotions make us think that God has changed. Your feelings and your emotions don't dictate, listen, how God's feeling. It's already settled. He cannot lie. Guess why God cannot lie? Y'all heard this before. What's today? Sunday. So if the Lord walked in and said it's Tuesday, oh, Lord, you're lying. The devil is a liar. I don't know how it's going to happen, but supernaturally time will accelerate and you'll be sitting in Tuesday. My God, I'm in church on Tuesday. Because when he speaks... It's going to come to pass. It doesn't matter how many days we're away from it. His word will bring you right up to the manifestation of what he said. That's why God is not intimidated by your situation that is so far away from being what he said. Because he knows when he speaks it or you send his word back to him, his word will accelerate your life and get you to what his word promised. So don't be dismayed about how far away you are. The word is greater to accelerate you, to bring you to that place to receive from the Lord. Somebody say, accelerate me, Lord. <laughs> God said, today we're going to accelerate things. You've been sitting in that, situ that contradiction too long. It's time for the contradiction to go and for you to begin to line up with the truth. The Bible describes Jesus as an anchor. Say an anchor. Pull up Hebrews 6, 18 through 20. Just, we're just trying to settle this and get this in your spirit that God is, 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 is listen, he's the same. He's not going to change. Get up this morning, I want to bless you. Get up tomorrow, I want to bless you. Get up ne next week, I want to bless you. Man, I blew it last night, I still want to bless you. I'm not going to change children. I'm not going to change sons. I'm not going to change daughters. Listen, don't compare me to a man. Don't compare me to your best friend. Don't compare me even to your spouse. I will never change. Listen to this. So it is impossible... For God to lie, for we know that his promise and his vow will never change. 
And now we have run into his heart to hide ourselves in his faithfulness. This is where we find strength and comfort for he empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time. Amen. Notice that. He empowers us to seize what has already been established ahead of time. An unshakable hope. We have this certain hope like a strong, unbreakable anchor holding our souls to God himself. Our anchor of hope, I love this, is fastened to the mercy seat, which sits in the heavenly realm beyond the sacred threshold. And where Jesus, our forerunner, has gone in before us, he is now and forever our royal priest like Melchizedek. Notice, it said it's impossible for God to lie. Jesus is the anchor of our hope. An anchor that's not fastened at the bottom of an ocean, but an anchor that's attached to the mercy seat of God. He attached the anchor of your hope to the mercy seat so you don't lose hope when you blow it. The anchor I'm talking about is not sitting in the Gulf of Mexico. It's not sitting in the Atlantic Ocean. It's sitting attached at the mercy seat. Now listen, no matter what an anchor does, whatever it's attached to, it keeps that thing from sailing away. A lot of y'all are here by the grace of God because of that anchor, because the devil was blowing stuff into your life that'll blew you away a long time ago. But it's God's anchor that's attached to the mercy seat. The mercy says, I'm going to bless you despite you. I'm going to not give you what you deserve. I'm still going to bless you no matter what you do. So listen, never lose hope based on your performance. Keep hope because of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. I got an anchor that's attached to the mercy seat of God. still attach you could have drunk last night you still attach you could have yelled at gotten an argument this morning with your spouse you still attach my god you turn your back on the lord you went out and do stuff you told them you would never do you're still attached to the lord you thought you were getting blown away but somehow you find your way in church this morning. My God, I just keep, I just keep bouncing back. I just keep coming back. What is it? It's what you're attached to. It's the attachment to the mercy seat of God. Oh my God. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by the spirit of the living God. I'm attached to the mercy seat of almighty God. The devil thought he was taking your life out to the deep, out to the abyss. He thought he was going to bring you out to the point of no return and drown you and suffocate you for life. But you are attached to the mercy seat of God. And God just went like this. Right out the devil's hand, right out the crack house, right out the bar, pulled you right out. I knew it wasn't me. It had to be something greater than me. Because I gave up, but God didn't. His mercy endures forever. Jesus took the wrath of God at the cross, so you never have to fear. Come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain grace and mercy in time of need. He has given you power this morning to, to, to seize what has already been given. Amen? Amen? And of course, in James 1.17, you don't have to go there, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So listen to this. So we have a promise that came from a God that can't lie, 
that is not mad at us, that can't change and won't change his mind about it. So what's the problem? What is the problem? If y'all had mirrors, I'd have you take out mirrors and look in it. <laughs> look at your neighbor and say, never blame the Lord. <laughs> the Bible says, how can two walk together except they be in agreement? The enemy has been a, doing a good job of getting us out of agreement before the promise can come to pass. Now, I'm going to be ministering, this is my final thing, on four areas that hinder us from receiving what the Lord, what has already been done for us. I'm going to get through three today, but the fourth one is so big that I, I can't, it's not to be a whole, it's, it's its own service. <laughs> it's its own message. So I'll be saving that one for next Sunday. But let's talk about these that the Lord given me. Some of the things that are hindering us from receiving what God has already done. Can you pull up Hebrews 6.15? And it says, and so after he had impatiently endured, he obtained the promise. One of the reasons we don't receive from the Lord is a lack of patience. A lack of patience. I notice we're raising a generation. Everybody's in a rush. The word process has become like a bad word. But how many understand that process and preparation is never a waste of time? Because whatever the thing is that's in the process or the preparation, it needs to go through that so when the demand comes, it can be able to withstand the new blessing that's coming into their lives. But I noticed that everybody's in a rush. Now listen, you're talking to somebody that God revealed his call to very, in my young Christian, like five months into the Lord, he told me what I was going to be doing. But listen, it took the close to 20 years for me to walk in it. But every stage of, of where I was at leading up to where I'm at right now was a stage of development to prepare me for what I'm doing right now. And sometimes we are not. We, we, what happens is the guy, the woman that receives the prophecy is not the one to walk it out. Let me say it again. David received a prophecy at 17 years old. Why didn't God grant it to him? Because David had to go through a process of development and maturing to become the man that's going to walk in the prophecy. And a lot of us think God is wasting our time when it's actually a time of development to prepare you for the very thing that you've been begging him for. He's too wise to give a Ferrari to a 10-year-old. So God will put the blessing on hold until you get developed enough to be able to handle a vehicle that can go that fast. And you think you can handle it, but listen, you, right now you're driving at 60 miles an hour. It's a lot different driving at 150 miles an hour. Things go by a lot faster and a lot quicker at 150 miles an hour. And sometimes you think you can handle it because you're cruising along at 60, and it's a big difference from 60 to 150. So patience. Miracles are not always instantaneous. Sometimes miracles are progressive. Sometimes we miss God because we're looking for the spectacular. And listen, sometimes it might be spectacular. But what if he chooses not to do it spe spectacular? That means you could miss God moving on your behalf because you're looking for something. You're looking for Jesus to come in a package that he's not coming in. Well, God, you did it for this person that way. God said, I'm not going to do it that way for you. I'm going to do something completely different for you. And don't try, to, try to, don't try to manipulate me to do something 
for you just because I did it for somebody else. I'm going to deal with you individually. And sometimes we try to manipulate God and make God move when, and listen, he said, I got my own way of moving. In Mark 8, 24, Jesus healed a blind man. I said, it says in two stages, he spit on his eyes, laid his hands, and he asked the man, what do you see? I see men as trees walking. Jesus lays his hands on him again, and his sight was restored. Sometimes miracles are progressive. Understand this, that a lot of things that are going to come to pass in your life are going to come to pass in this, this fashion, in a sequence of events. And God will use a sequence of events to bring the thing that you're believing him for to come to pass. But you got you can't get impatient in the process because you'll miss the miracle. It said after Abraham patiently endured, he obtained the promise. That's telling me if he got impatient, he would have never obtained the promise of God. And a lot of us get impatient with the Lord and you'll know it because you go to plan B. You must remember, God is always thinking redemption. Somebody say redemption. Redemption. When God saves you, he's not just thinking about you. He's thinking about your whole family. That's what I tell our brothers and sisters in the faith home. Listen, if you think this is just about you or a Freedom Center member that gave your life to the Lord, if you think this is just about you, you don't know God. Because God said, I, the blessing to all families of the earth, are blessed. God wants your whole family blessed, not just you. And sometimes we're getting God, we want God to move quickly. And what it is, God is using your life as an illustration to witness to your family or to other people that are looking at you going through this situation because they want to see how you're going to handle it. Sometimes he's using your life and your situation to preach the gospel to onlookers. You know, preaching is not just a guy up here with a mic. Sometimes preaching is a visible. The Bible says you are living epistles. That the, God is still writing the Bible out through your life. That you're a living epistle. And God is using your life as an epistle so people can see, man seen that brother go through that I didn't know how and he he came out now they want to know about your Jesus so we have to be patient James said let patience have her perfect work that you can be perfect and entire wanting nothing look at your name and say what's the rush You know what some people think? That life is passing them by. Life ain't going nowhere. Matter of fact, when it's all summed up, you'll be right where you're supposed to be. Listen to this. You're not, you're, you, you you doing it your way is not going to get you there faster. Let me say that again. You doing it your way is not going to get you there faster. Shortcuts always turn out to be the long way around in the kingdom of God. And you'll come right back around to where you took the shortcut. When you could have stayed the whole time and made progress. But thank God for mercy that he'll accelerate you and get you where you need to be. So we need to be patient that we can be perfect and entire wanting nothing. So a lack of patience will get you out of agreement with the promise of God. When you get patient, you get anxious, and you come out of agreement with God. Next one. Can you pull up 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18? Now, listen, anybody, if you you tell somebody, man, give me the hindrances of of why people don't receive from God. Oh, they don't understand their righteousness, this, this, this. But it's not like that when I study. I'm I'm, I'm asking the Holy Spirit. I I can do that off the top of my head. But what's in the congregation? That needs to be addressed. 
I don't want a message that some guy preached in another church that don't fit in this church. Lord, give me a tailor-made message for the group of people that's in this body. So that tells me right there to some people that's been impatient. And then the next topic we're about to deal with. Somebody say unholy alliances. Okay, it says, don't continue to team up with unbelievers in mismatch alliances. For what partnership is there between righteousness and rebellion? Who could mingle light with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and Satan? Or what does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What friendship does God's temple have with demons? For indeed, we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, I will make my home in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. For this reason, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch nothing that is unclean and I will embrace you. I will be a true father to you and you will be my beloved sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Sometimes we are trying to be in agreement with the Lord, but it's not happening because we are in agreement with something he's not in agreement with. Now, listen, I touched on it a little bit last Sunday, but one day I got to stand before the Lord and I got to give an account to what I preach. And I'm not going to about to stand to him. He, and he said, you did not. You gave all these feel good messages and you did not deal with people that were sitting right in your church dealing with sin and all kinds of stuff. Now, listen, I'm reading out of the New Testament, so nobody don't try to throw nothing at me. Old Testament. No, New Testament. Come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. Yeah, I got freedom. Yeah, I got liberty. Yeah, I got grace. But the Bible says, Paul said, because I got grace, shall I continue to sin? He said, God forbid, the grace of God should move you to righteousness, not loose living. Sometimes we are trying to be in agreement with the Lord, but it's not happening because we're in agreement with something he's not in agreement with. Alliances with people that don't believe like you do. And this can hinder the promise of God from coming to pass in your life. He says, come out from among them and I will be a father to you. Yeah. Wait a minute. So God's benefits as my father get put on hold when I'm attached to an unholy alliance. He says, come out and I will be. I will be when you come out. I'll be Jehovah Jireh when you come out. I'll be your healer when you come out. I'll be your deliverer when you come out. You got to come out. The prodigal son was not fatherless, but he was living in conditions that made it look like he had no father. Remember what the story said. The Bible says he joined himself to a citizen of that land. Then it said no man gave to him, which signifies that the favor of God lifted off his life. So the Bible says that he joined himself to a citizen of that land, an unbeliever. Look at your name and say, be careful who you join yourself to. You got to be careful who you team up with. You got to be careful who you covenant with. Sometimes we have to say no. When they say, will you join us after work for a drink? No. I can't do it. I won't do it. But some of us rather have the favor of men than the favor of God. So we'll go right up in the bar and be drinking because we don't want to go through persecution for being a witness for Jesus Christ. But you got to say no and be willing to take a licking and keep on ticking and let God's favor show up in your life. And when they ridicule you and persecute you, watch the elevator of favor rise up and then you will be their boss. 
Somebody say, the script can flip. The script can flip. Oh, man, we let that guy have it, man, because he wanted to come out with a drink. Now he got promoted. He's the boss now. Oh, my God. <laughs> Repent. <laughs> He's the boss. <laughs> be careful. So be careful who you join yourself with. Come out from among them. It could be family members. Listen, I got some family. I love them. I bless them. I witness to them. But I ain't hanging out with them. I told you all when I used to go up north and visit my family, here comes the, the sun going down. Hey, we going out. You want to come out with it? Nope. <laughs> going back to my grandmother's house. <laughs> then in the morning, I come knocking at the door with breakfast. <laughs> How y'all doing? Hangover. Oh, oh you? Man, it's early. Early will I seek thee. Yeah. A fresh anointing instead of a fresh hangover. <laughs> My God, no hangover. So you got to be careful who you join you so you might come out from, from among them. You, I'm telling you, you might get some heat, but take the heat because the blessing is going to be worth it. Amen? Take the heat. Take the heat. God will be in there with you. He hears. God hears everything. He hears what they're saying in their bedrooms. He hears what they're saying in the lunchroom. He hears what they're, they're saying. He, he, he hears it all. You don't got to worry about no fly on the wall. The Lord is in the house. That's why one of my daily confessions is no weapon formed against me can prosper. And every tongue that rise against me. My family, this church, in judgment, we will condemn it. We will show it to be in the wrong. So any tongue, man, woman, devil that rises against me or my family or this church in judgment is going to run into the promise of God. And God is going to make sure that those tongues, listen, do not play out. That that prophecy of death and doom will not come to pass. Matter of fact, they actually assist in my success. Because when they, they say it's not going to work, God says, oh, my God, my son is standing on what no weapon formed against us a problem. Every tongue, there's a tongue that risen against Pastor Tony in judgment. Oh, my God, I got to make sure we condemn it, that it does not come to pass, that just the opposite plays out. Look at your neighbor and say, don't talk about Pastor Tom. <laughs> Listen, this was before I was a pastor. I ain't talking about no man of God. Come People on. come in and be like, Listen, that's, man, you hear what that dude's, for? hey. God got to deal with that. The Roman says he will deal with his servants. I ain't touching that. Maybe sometimes that's what could be hindering our blessing. But we're putting our mouth on the wrong people. When you should be confessing the word instead of tearing people down. Maybe that's opening the door for the devourer to come into your life and kill, steal, and destroy. I told the staff here, listen, really, I'm, I, I ain't got no time for politics. I'm too busy working for the Lord, and when I'm not working, I'm too busy with my family and engrossed into the things of the God. Prayer, meditation. I don't have time for politics. Yeah. Unholy alliance. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Proverbs 13, 20 says, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. This is the Bible. Unholy alliance. Listen, show the love of God. We got to show the love of God. I'm not saying don't minister and, and love and we help people. I'm not saying that. 
I'm talking about joining them. Man, you witness to me, why don't you come out and get a, a bear with me now? No, man, I can't do that. Show the love of God, but don't join into the practices that dishonor the Lord. Now, gentlemen, if you could pull up 2 Corinthians 7, 1 in the Passion, there is a connection between the promise and the way you're living. Now, that's all one thought that, that Corinthians, the, the writers divided it, but he's still continuing in that flow of the come out from among them. He's still in that vein of thought. Beloved ones with promises like these, and because of our deepest respect and worship of God, we must remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit and continue to complete the development of holiness within us. I heard that when I was in my office when I was talking about holiness. And I think God is calling us back to holiness. I'm not talking about righteousness. You're already right with God. I'm talking about living right. But it said, beloved, with promises like these, because of our deepest respect and worship of God, we must remove. Why? Because the promise is on the line. It's not worth it. It contaminates us. And there's a promise when we get contaminated, it stunts our growth. We hinder our personal development when we have an unholy alliance in your in our lives your promotion is connected to your development your development is connected to you fulfilling the call of God on your life he gave us power to become the sons of God if you hinder your development you're hindering the call of God on your life there's no alliance that's worth you missing out on what God has for your life Everybody want got to have a friend. I'll find a friend in Jesus first before I get the wrong friends. You might have to eat lunch by yourself, but that's all right. God always has a witness in a company, in a city, in a... He always has a witness. There's probably somebody next to you dealing with the same struggle. Remember, the one who heard the prophecy has to be developed into the man or woman to walk in the prophecy. I think that blew over y'all's head. The one who heard the prophecy, you're going to do this great thing for me. I'm going to give you a miracle ministry. You're going to travel all around the world. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Now we're going to develop you. He declares the end at the beginning, but it don't bypass the process. You can't get around that. You got to walk through it. Gentlemen, can you pull up Hebrews 10, 23 in the Amplified? God for all these different versions. Like, ah, that one don't fit. Oh, Jesus. Next one. Things that hinder our faith. Did y'all read the bulletin? It says the power of confession. And our sister Nikki, this thing could be in a book. She wrote out a confession from the book of Colossians 1. Uh, verses, what? A lot, amen, in Colossians, the whole, <laughs> the whole chapter, amen? But she says she began to confess this stuff, and she's noting, noticing changes in her home. She knows the promises, but there's something about vocalizing the promises that changes atmospheres. The atmosphere is changing now. <laughs> What's the other verse? The spirit. spirit of the Lord is here. Well, open your mouth. I don't want to just sing about it. I want to see it show up in my life. And you might have to declare the promises of God to really make that song a reality. I don't need it in here. I need it at home. Hebrews 
Hebrews 10, 23. Listen to this. Let us <laughs> stop it, praise team. Let us seize. It was? Oh, man. The Lord wanted me to do it. It's on me. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 23, it says, let us seize and hold tightly the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is reliable, trustworthy, and faithful to his word. So that's telling you right there there's a connection between your confession and the promise of God. And Jesus, who watches over your confession, is the one that's banking on you, holding on to it until he can bring it to pass yeah. or manifest it. A confession of your faith is easy to initiate, but difficult to maintain over time. The time in between praying and manifestation is the time your faith will be tested. The question, can you hold fast to that confession of faith? Notice it says without wavering. Why did the Bible say without wavering? Because the Lord is warning you that will, there will be resistance to that confession. I don't know why people like get like blown away when, when opposition comes. He tells us in the Bible that in this world you will have, he's trying to warn you, it's not going to be all nice and pretty sometimes. Sometimes it's going to be rough. But can you hold fast to your confession of faith? Until the faithful one that promise brings it to pass. Now, a few Wednesdays ago, it, it was right after I came off of vacation, the Lord gave me this word. I, didn't, I felt led not to pre-preach re -preach the whole thing, but I want to touch on it. But the Lord told me, said, listen, you and the people got to begin to declare what I said. Can you guys, can you pull up Proverbs 18, 20 in the King James? He spoke this word to me on vacation. Listen to this. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Go, go back to 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth. What is God saying? You can satisfy your life by speaking what you want, by speaking the word. But he said it's not a one-time speaking, it's a continual speaking on a daily basis because what you speak on a daily basis eventually becomes established in your life. God told Job said, I will decree a thing and it will be established but if you're feeling unsatisfied in the area God is saying go to work and speak my word over that area can I tell you something every area I've been declaring it I've been seeing manifestation I'm like oh my God and the Lord's like you think I was going to lie to you if you do that, I will, I will do it. Don't let your words get out of agreement with the promise. Sometimes we come to the altar. Yes, God's a healer. God's a deliverer. God's my source. And then the bill comes in the mail and said, help. Help. You dropped it. You dropped it. In the face of opposition, in the face of contradicting circumstances, you got to still say, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm still healed. You got to say, according to Philippians 4.19, God's still going to supply all my needs. Get out of here, devil. But a lot of us cave because the devil throws paper at us. Pay 
paper in the mail. Some of that stuff you probably don't need to open. Be like, I know what this is. Trashy. But listen, hold on to your confession of faith. And I encourage you guys to lay, this is powerful, good stuff. You can start right there, amen? But listen, next week, next week, the area I'm going to be hitting on, the Lord showed me one of the reasons we don't receive from him. We're actually, it's crazy because we're, we're about to do it in our leadership now. A lack of honor. I'm going to give you an appetizer. <laughs> Go back and watch Wally's message from Wednesday about the sin of familiarity. It, it's almost like part two of that. But listen to this. The Lord said, he said something in, in his message. And he said that leadership, sometimes the way they carry themselves, it demands honor. But listen, when you have true honor that comes from God, it doesn't matter who the leader is. If not, it's conditional honor. And it's honor based on uh, either fear or you try a low self-esteem and you trying to be getting good with that person. But that's God showed me that's not my honor. My honor don't change. That's why when I came to the lighthouse in 1999, there was guys here that I used to teach that were now running the place. And the Lord told me, you submit to them. You listen to what they say and you honor them as the leaders of this ministry. And I learned that during that season what true honor looks like. And it's not based on who's there or who's not there. That's not the honor that comes from God because the honor that comes from God is the honor don't matter who's in position. The boss is gone for a week. Let's act crazy. Can I tell y'all something? I'm the same guy as when Bishop was here. All that stuff Bishop used to do to other people, real, I, I, I'm trying to, I was trying to think in my mind, is it ever? And it, maybe one, and he like caught himself, but it, what it was, because he said, he knew, I honored him. So it don't matter if you're here or you're not here. I'm still, because my honor, I'm ultimately trying to honor my honor in the Lord. And I automatically honor a man. But when you say you honor somebody, you go around them, you're not honoring them. Yeah, he really, it was weird. I'm, I'm studying this, and then as you begin to study, he started leading me into this honor thing, and, and I got to devote a whole uh, service to it, but... And I'll leave you with this. And this is why it's so important. Remember what the Bible says when Jesus went to his hometown. And he said, a prophet is without honor in his hometown. And then the Bible says this. He could not do many miracles there because they did not honor him. It actually hindered the power of God. You know, people, some people come. Listen, and I'm, not, I'm not saying this to, to get. I don't, you can call me whatever you want to call me. But some people come and, hey, Tony. Tony can't give you nothing. But my pastoral anointing, if you recognize that and honor that, what's happening in my life will come into your life. But if you see me just as Tony, Tony can't give you nothing. But Pastor Tony, that's where the grace, the power of God is to change and transform lives. If, if she's just Jeanette, <laughs> and listen, my wife is anointed by God. I'm not bragging. There's a lot of anointed women in this place. But my wife is anointed by God. If she's just Jeanette, Jeanette can't give you nothing. But Pastor Jeanette, who's co labor with me in this ministry, is full of life. And listen, we got to have real biblical honor, not honor-based life. I don't like the way they talk. I don't like the way they, Bishop didn't do it like that. I went. Well, he's not here no more. Right. 
When David was dancing before the ark of the Lord, Saul's daughter got her mouth messed up. And she said, oh, look at the king. He really acting like a king. And, the, and David rebuked her and said, listen, it's because the Lord delighted in me while I'm here in this position. And somebody from your house is not. So that's your appetizer. And listen to this. this. This is the thing. Yes, thank you. Bishop honored me. That man said, Tone, you're a call to be the pastor of this church. I never asked for it. The man honored me. So you say you honor him, but you're not honoring the guy that he put in position. You don't honor him. You're playing the game. Your honor is based on a personality. If you need a whip to honor a man, you don't understand your sonship. Whips. I'm not no slave. I don't need a whip. I'm a son. So honor is a part of my DNA. Let me stop right there. Let me stop. You know, at first it used to bother me, and then the Lord said, don't let that bother you. That doesn't hurt you. That doesn't diminish who you are in me. It's just hindering what they receive. Amen? Amen. Let me stop. Amen. Y'all been blessed? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo! Come back next week. Woo! Amen. Amen. Before we close, we always want to ask the question. If there's anybody here that has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand if you're here. You've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Maybe you're here this morning and you uh, accept him at one time, but you have not been walking with him and you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. If that's you, raise your hand. You want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Anybody? All y'all saved? Everybody full of the Holy Ghost? Anybody need to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Sounds good. Amen. We're going to dismiss, and the prayer team will be up here. If you need special prayer, please feel free to come up. Amen. Let's lift our hands up to the Lord. Father, we just bless you. We thank you for your word. And, uh, Father, seal it in our hearts. Father, you have already done it. Let us receive what you have already done. Repeat this after me. Today, today is the day, is the day that, the that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Glad in it. Today, today, I receive, I receive by, faith by faith everything, everything that, God that God has promised for me. No more doubting. No more, doubting. No more questioning. No more, questioning. No more impatience. No more talking crazy. I receive the goodness of God today in my life. Hallelujah. Glory. Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Amen. Be blessed. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.